everybody and welcome to another episode of two shots in the ball here i'm neil gordon i'm here with my co- head coach of cbu men's basketball team matt skin hey matt fours up fours in the air adam dead chan how are you doing over there buddy doing well sir happy to be back with you guys yeah i think we did a great job on last week's game lots to improve on you know we'll get better each week but this week we're taking on cbu and UNB on the men's side the fourth game of the first day, it's quarterfinal number two. Game finishes 77-76 UNB, and it gets wild at the end. So Don't tell me again, man. Don't tell me again. <laughs> it's going to be a tough one for you, Coach. <laughs> oh, man. But to get it all started off, your man Osman Omar just has an unbelievable first quarter. First quarter ends, what was it, 32-11? So just a wild first quarter. Why don't you explain how the offense worked that day and uh, the game plan going in? Yeah, we, we came up with a game plan at the beginning of the week that we felt really confident with, and that was that we weren't going to start Cooper Ward. And we felt like Cooper was one of the best rookies in the league, and we feel like he's going to be one of the better post players in the league for a long time. So we sat him down and had a conversation about that because we wanted to play a little bit faster and, you know, thought we had better matchups that way if we were able to um, – you know, play a little bit smaller. And like you said, we kind of, we came out flying and, you know, I, I think um, the energy, um, you know, the guys who had been there before, like Paul and Ozzy, who had great success on that floor the year before. And, um, you know, guys like, even guys like CJ, who, uh, you know, it was his first game there in his first year in the AUS, but he had played at Humber before and had played in a lot of big games in the, at CCAA Nationals. And, you know, those guys were just ready. Uh, and I, I thought they came out and executed the game plan, you know, perfectly, especially to start. You know, I, I mean, overall, I thought we executed the game plan really, really well, did everything that we asked of them to do. And, um, you know, we wanted to push the pace. We wanted to get the ball down the floor as quick as we could. We wanted to space them out. We thought that UMB had really good, like, individual defenders one-on-one who could, you know, really keep guys in front of them. Um, one-on-one so we wanted to get the ball moving from side to side you know put them in actions that you know we thought would would get them a little bit off balance and um, you know like I said Ozzy just kind of came out on on fire and was and was doing a little bit of everything and uh, he was a leader for us and, and led the way especially at the beginning. You know we were talking a lot about it on the broadcast too coming into it you guys have been in some tight ball games down the stretch of the season you know, you were still fighting for position and for seeding uh, the, really the whole time, the last, you know, five, seven games of the year. So you were playing playoff basketball simulated kind of the whole way. And it seemed like a lot of that just carried right over where just felt like you were in these big moments um, all along and, and seemed totally ready for it. Yeah, I thought we played in close games the whole year, actually. I think Neil mentioned it last week, seven games or something like that in single digits. And We lost a lot of really close games. So we felt like we were prepared for that moment and prepared to, you know, do what we needed to do in that environment. Um, You know, I got to be honest, when I, when I came back last year, I remember like our first meeting of the year, I was like, okay, you know, our goal is to get, I I still call it the Metro center. I was like, our goal is to get to the Metro center and everybody besides Shakir was like, what's that? You know, like they, yeah, right. Because they hadn't been to the playoffs. And it was one of those things for me where it was a little bit sad because that was, that's kind of always what you want. You want to get there and give yourself that opportunity. And so it was really cool to see them, you know, these guys in their second year there, you know, kind of just take the reins with it, lead themselves. And I, I, I liked, I said that both years I, I, to the team, I, I, the kind of the whole year, I let the team kind of figure things out. You know, don't call a lot of timeouts, let them play. And, but then going into the playoffs last year and this year, I, uh, as soon as our last game of the year was finished and we knew we were in, I just said, just follow me. Just like, I'll tell you when to eat, when to sleep, when to practice, when to, like, I feel like 
as a coach, I have pretty good experience there, you know, in, at the Scotiabank Center and just said, just follow what we're going to do. We're going to tell you, we're, we're going to have the confidence that we, when we do get on the floor, we're going to be ready. Yeah, I mean, three national championships later, I think you figured out the formula <laughs> for that stuff. There's no doubt about that. For sure. But, you know, what seemed like things were really kind of going right, you kind of come out, bang, two, three-point shots right off the jump. You know, you guys aren't, aren't exactly world beaters at shooting the three. You do a lot of stuff great. That necessarily wasn't one of them. Yep. But that was an awesome start there. And it kind of almost softened things up because then you went five out. You mentioned the starting lineup. Bennett got downhill on Masters early, one-on-one. Mm -hmm beat them hard off the dribble. There's no help side there because they're worried about their guys. On the other side, you were spread so nicely in formation. I mean, that was a, a, a wonderfully executed start. You had to be happy. Yeah, just thrilled. And like I, I, we said in our office, we thought we were like five made threes away from being in second place in the conference, you know, legitimately. And we talked about that a lot, you know, especially David at Kapinga and I, just how close we were. And, you, you know, we just love going to practice. I mean, here I'm. I, this is probably like an infomercial for CBU basketball, but we just love going to practice. Like we had great guys that they came in and they worked hard. When we had individuals, they came in and worked hard. They didn't miss. You know, like as far as putting the time in, we were super competitive in practice every day, and we we stat everything and you know keep keep score of everything and have you know. Like punishments if you want to say for the team that loses and these guys just went after it there was never really a time where we went in and after practice we walked out we were just like that was that was shitty today right so right it was it was great and like I said for these guys to kind of take take that on and you know we knew we had to make threes that was our that was our thing the whole year if we could make some threes we knew we had the athleticism to get to the paint so if we could make a couple threes and kind of make teams think a little bit about coming out to us, we thought we'd be successful. So obviously you couldn't have written up a better start. Yeah, that went really well. I've got a couple um, instances marked here. I thought a huge moment was a great example of team defense. Watson, obviously defensive player of the year previous year, pitcher crosses him over. And the second that he feels he has room, boom, he runs into the wall. That is Diawara charge yeah. in the key team goes nuts what you know team defense was a big factor and I think uh, it's just a really good example too because the second that it looks like Watson's going to lose pitcher Diawar's eyes are boom locked in sets his feet he's ready to take the charge so just special defense you know that you kept him to 11 points at the quarter what what can you say about team defense made a few adjustments late in the season I'm a big like force we can uh, coach defensively, but later in the season, we just started talking more about just keeping the ball out of the paint. And it was a little bit of a change for us. And the guys kind of really ad ad adapted and like Eb Ibrahim for us is just such a great help defender. And if his responsibility was to be basket help, the guys knew that he was going to be there every single time. So um, you know, you mentioned Paul. I think Paul on the ball defensively is just gifted. One of the best in the country, six 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 seven. You know, I don't even know what his wingspan is. But I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if a lot of guys on the team said that he wasn't our best defender. You know, Ibrahim guards everybody. He's guarded, uh, you know, this past year he guarded Justin Andrew and Azaro Roker in the same game when we played X, right? So, like – he just has that versatility too. And, you know, to be honest, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get a bunch of guys that are the same um, so that we can be pretty switchable. And that's what we were allowed, we were able to do, especially early in the game, be switchable, try to keep the guys in front of us. And we knew how talented they were, especially Dumboya. And that was Ibrahim's matchup. We said every second that he's going to be on the floor, you're going to be on the floor guarding him. And he took that challenge from the beginning of the week and, and just ran with it. It's amazing, man. And, and even when he's not taking charges on the backside, like you said, as a guard, you just always know he's there. You see him into the corner of your eye. You look in there. Can I see something next level? Is there an opportunity to get into the paint? And then you just see this. It, it, he's a mountain of a guy. Like, I don't know how oh, he yeah. moves that fast to get into possession. A wonderful athlete, right? Just yeah. built strong, great feet, gets in the right spots. And, you know, one thing you said there that, that kind of stuck with me too, you know, Watson and DOR are great. But I think Ozzy Omar is an underrated defender. He had a great steal in this game. 
got himself out and running with the basketball. Not long after that, he had a poke from behind on a guy. You know, his teammate collected it, got it out to him in transition again. He does a lot of stuff defensively that you think, you know, him as a scorer, but he's way more than that. Yeah, last year especially, he was the leader for how we get up and press at the point of attack. It's just He's just so quick that, you know, he and he can keep guys in front of us. But, you know, at the beginning of this year, we had to sit him down because synergy-wise and stat-wise, he was our, our worst defender points per possession for the first four or six games of the season. And I just, I just think it was just because he had so much confidence that he could get up and pressure the ball because he knew guys would be behind him and helping him that he felt like he could be a little bit more aggressive. But it was really hurting us because guys were getting downhill and we were just rotating too much. And so I felt in the second half of the year, he did a really good job of like stabilizing himself and, you know, not being too hoppy on the ball. Like that's what we kind of call it. Like, not that – just a little bit too twitchy. The guy's all twitch anyway, but like just a little bit too hoppy and, like, wanting to be on the ball. And he really, you know, settled down and, and did a great job. And, and he can get a piece of the ball and he can deny out a little bit and get a piece of the ball for a layup. And, I mean, he, he gets a couple steals like that a game. I mean, really, you know, UMB also hit two three-point shots with their first couple buckets, uh, a little more spaced out than yours were. But then after that, there was nothing, you know, five points the rest of the way. And, and the on-ball defense, the health defense, uh, yeah, was a massive part of that. I was going to mention Watson does a pull-up in transition three. And, you know, that's, that's not really his game. But he lets it fly there and clearly he's feeling good. You know, what's it like to be coaching a team that is hitting the shots and you can watch a guy like Watson pull up, you know, five feet from behind the arc and splash one? It well, before, what's it look like from the bench? Before you get into that. I want to talk about Watson a little bit. I want to ask his coach. This guy is a phenomenal athlete. You mentioned his wingspan, nasty defender, athletic. I think he can get more nasty offensively, man, myself. Like, he can, you know, he can shoot it and hit his sling it a little bit. But mm-hmm. at the rim, I always I, – I just want him to explode at the rim or something more because he – really, this is a first-team all-star type of guy if he mm-hmm. adds that part to his game. Yeah, like we – like I said, we keep stats in practice every day, and I think – like 90% of the practices, he's our number one stack guy just with everything he does, with the assists, with the rebounds, with the touches, with the steals. And we just really encouraged him at the end of this year to shoot the ball more. I think that's the kind of the key is if he's shooting the three, um, he can get to the rim. And if they're, even if teams are just thinking about it and he hits one, we said, Paul, if you shoot three and you hit one, that's 33%. That's pretty good. And if you're going a little bit more, then shoot four or five and hit two. And then we're kind of in the percentage that we're looking for. And if you look at the stats down the stretch uh, of the season, the last five or six games, he was getting up between four and five a game. And I, th- I thought that really changed the flow for us offensively. And it was just one of those things that, as again, as a staff that we were very conscious of. When we came in last year, he – didn't shoot the three a lot and so we were really starting to encourage him to shoot the three and then we knew it probably wouldn't happen last year and we knew this year it would kind of start to happen gradually and we feel next year that's just going to be normal for him with you know shooting four or five threes a game and hitting you know two or three hopefully Uh, so that's that's the plan but I agree with you like there's times where he can go up and he should just be hammering it on people um, you know, getting up off two feet, off one foot, and just hammering it. You know, he's just so long. He's right at the rim. I mean, he's had he had some of the best highlights in the in the league this year with some of his dunks. Um, but we're just going to keep encouraging him to be aggressive. And I mean, listen, we're not smashing him. He was oh, no. thirteen and nine in the game, five and ten from the field, two of four from downtown. Wonderful player, oh, great yeah. impact in this particular game we're talking about today. But you know, there's always there's always room to grow, like you said for sure. But but Neil, man, no, that's a great I, point to see that. Listen, I, I think he's the same. I, I think he's a first team all star, you know, all Canadian level player if he if he's really going. And we just have to keep encouraging him to do that because we believe in him to be able to do that. Okay, I think that sums up the first quarter. A great CBU start now. It'll probably get less fun here, Coach Skin. But uh, UNB, I found in the first quarter, they had a tough time finding one-on-one matchups. And that's because you guys are so athletic, one through five. There's no small length, and there's no slow guy on the court. 
So UMB makes a change in the second quarter. They go on a 13-2 run to open the second. Um, what did they do specifically that kind of slowed your guys down a touch? Uh, I mean, they, they're a really good team, I think, first of all. I, I think after that first quarter, I mean, especially what the coaching staff talked about was – I, I just always feel it's going to be a close game in the playoffs. So, you know, even though we had that amazing start and obviously you hate to lose a game like that, we just felt the game was going to be close. So it, it, it didn't really surprise me that UMB made a run. Um, I think when you're missing shots against UMB and they're able to play a little bit faster and get out in transition, that's their, that's their key. That's their bread and butter. And when they're getting up and down and running and finding threes in the corner and, you know, they have five guys on the floor as well who can get a rebound and kind of rip and go themselves. And when they do that, and like I said, they get two shooters running to the corners every time. They really spread you out. And um, I, I, I feel a little bit like it was just our, our team was just feeling really good. And so I thought we, we probably took a couple of quick shots, you know, not necessarily the best shots that we wanted. Uh, and that kind of led to the run. You kind of live and die by that a little bit, right? Like those shots were going down in the first quarter. So you're saying, you know, why not keep slinging it? And, you know, to yeah. your credit, you, you kept it real cool and said, you know what, these eventually will fall again, kind of keep shooting, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but, you, but no doubt about it, UAB's transition was the thing that really kind of stood out to start the quarter. I thought they crashed the offensive glass really hard in the second quarter as well. Um, that's kind of some, some trademark Coach Baker stuff is mm -hmm. they started to contest shots more. They started to gain rebound really at both ends. Uh, De Boya was crashing. Masters was slashing. And it's just one of those times. Like the, you said it, the playoffs, there's going to be big runs. You can't possibly stay as hot as you guys were at the start. Right. It's just not, just not possible for any team. Um, and, and it's just one of those things, man. Like you know, it took about, what was it, about 450 to get your first bucket, but there's some quality shots mixed in there. And, and sometimes they just don't fall, but yep. you just got to stay the course. And, and your body language in particular was fantastic of just staying cool and saying, boys, we're going to keep playing. Yeah, we just, we just had to keep playing. And I don't think UMB is the top team in the conference for doing this, but they're definitely a volume team as well where they're looking for, you know, sh they're like I think St. FX is the – number one volume team in the league, just as far as the, the more shots we get up, the better. We're just going to like dump and chase to use a hockey term, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just get it up, go get it. The, the team, the best team I've ever seen do that was Timmy Kendrick's old teams at PEI. Literally, they like, literally they just put like these five, like ridiculous athletes out there. They would, one pass, chuck it up, and just send five guys to the glass and say, "We're just going to shoot more shots and out, you know, out athlete you." But yeah. UMB, that that's what UMB has a little bit of that in their game. Where if you're if you're missing shots and you know giving them extra possessions with either turnovers uh, or offensive rebounds, you're going to be in trouble. And we knew that going into the game, and it, they were just going to they, they were bound to go on a run. So it really didn't phase me. And I felt the guys did a pretty good job of, like, you know, stabilizing themselves in that second quarter. Yeah, and, and to their credit, too, man, and, and it's like you said as well, they shot 45% from the game. So they yeah. were getting volume shots, but they were hitting a lot of their first attempts, right? They, they sure. were pretty, pretty hot, uh, particularly for the last three quarters. They really got it going. And, you know, one thing that, you know, it, it's kind of smart for any coach to look at, once you guys stopped making some threes, they started to pack that pain a little bit more there, right? Then your guys feel like, okay, we're going to get downhill. There was more bodies, more help, uh, and, and a few turnovers in there were a result of that, I thought. Yeah, for sure. I, I thought all year for our team, I felt we were one of the best in the conference, I, maybe even better than that, as far as our first shot defense was concerned. You know, if a team was going to run an action that we were prepared for and we could echo the call and we could, you know, go through what they were doing, you know, we felt our first shot defense was incredible. You know, just as far as getting that contest, if they make it or miss it, that's fine. You know, but then we had, we had to finish the play or we started using the Miami Heat term at the end of the year. It was uh, getting kills. You know, we just you had to try to get kill as many kills as we could. And, I mean, yeah, I mean, 
I don't know, really know what else to say. They just kind of got going. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like we should uh, name some stars at UMB. You know, we've done a great job sure. at CBU to this point, but, you know, freakish athletes over there in New Brunswick. Demboya, huge length, just so fast for his size. Solid body, too, can set a screen so hard. You know, Leah Todd, great length as well. And, and then you got sharpshooters, Pharrell and uh, Daniel Pitcher. You know, it, it's just so impressive what they have there in UMB. They're the three seed. You know, they didn't have a great first quarter, but it all didn't disappear there clearly, and they started putting the bucket all up yeah. in the second quarter. Yeah, and, and Neil, in our production meetings and stuff like that, thinking who are we going to highlight pregame, you know, a lot of people say Spurl is going to be Masters, whoever, but but I was about De, Ibrahim Deboya. Like, he, you know, his numbers might not have been as, as high points for game-wise as those other dudes, but this guy is kind of the heart and soul of what drives them. He, he boards, he slashes. I mean, he guards really well also. I mean, there were some times where he just clogged the paint one-on-one. -on -one. You know, Watson tried to take on him a few times. Uh, the OR did as well. And, and to Du Bois' credit, his defense was just as fantastic. But I think it's his rebounding, his motor that Coach Baker loves the most. And it's certainly, you know, something I loved watching as well. Hell of yeah, a thing I, to deal with on the other side. Yeah, well, the cool part for me is that I've known Eba for a while. He, he he's from high Calgary and I got to watch him for a couple of years in high school play and was recruiting him um, at, at the university of Calgary as well. And, you know, to kind of watch him evolve the, the, the cool thing about Eba is he played for a really good high school coach um, at Lester B Pearson high school, um, Billy Mitchell. And he, he like, he had him kind of moving all over the floor, kind of like Baker does. You normally would have a guy like that. Like if you had a guy like that in the Maritimes, they would probably stick him underneath the basket a lot of times and say, you know, go do work down there. But he was moving all over the place, ran a similar type offense as UNB does. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's just a great player. He had that body in grade 11. Like that guy, that guy's, <laughs> that guy's been like that for forever. Right. And so, you know, to, to see that guy kind of continue, continue to develop and become the star that he is, he's, he's a great player. And, um, you know, I think they're similar on offense as they are on defense is that they just put so much pressure on you one-on-one -on -one, where you can do a lot of really good things one-on-one -on -one defensively. Um, and, you, like, you can do a lot of really good things one-on-one -on -one offensively and make a good move. And they're very good in those situations of, playing well one-on-one -on -one and they can just make plays at the end of shot clocks in those second shot opportunities like I was talking about um they just are able to create and, and just cause havoc on offense so you mentioned that Watson Omar had a great first half uh Allen always interviews the leading coach you know he comes in with a little uh misinformation gives you the wrong score coach skin but you quickly corrected him he said 42 you knew it was 44 30 at half and uh, he started picking your brain about the first half. Yeah, no, it was good. I felt that uh, Alan and I have really good rapport off the floor. So, like, we had a really good uh, interview. And he was kind of talking to me off camera about, you know, the type of defense we were going to play and, like, what we were doing, you know, in the first half and asked if we were playing zone. I just didn't want to get give everything away to him, you know. like I didn't <laughs> Exactly. Wanna, I didn't want to, <laughs> excuse, excuse me, give away the whole game plan of what was happening. So, but he always does a great job, and like I said, he asked some really good questions. I think uh, Popovich would have been upset, though. I think he asked three <laughs> questions instead of two. Oh, yeah, I mean, you're exactly. <laughs> and, and Alan's a stat guy. Like, how did he get the score wrong at halftime, dog? Get the yeah. score right. Come on. Uh, yeah, Alan is, a, is, a, is an awesome Notice job what guy. defense you were playing about three minutes in. No, it's the so defense, though. Yeah, the defense, <laughs> Honest to God, man. But he, but he was exactly right because it, it, it set up what was an unbelievable third quarter. Back and forth, right? You, you guys were kind of staying the course there. It got to 56-36. You would be at a timeout. They went on a 9-0 run. You guys came back right after that 8-2 run. And then, man, the big finish, Neil. Yeah, the dagger that was. Everybody starts getting out of their chair, ready to roll for another beer at the end of the third. But Pitcher gets this shot off three-quarter court and bangs it down. We're going to go to Jay Callahan. Omar spotting up on the left. Callahan for three. Just misses. And that'll do it. Oh! The knock it down, Dan Pitcher! This is way after the clock, I think. Let's see.
we didn't find a look that really verified that that's a good shot. So, you know, tough one win against you there, Coach Skin. What was your thought leaving that third quarter on such an ugly note? Yeah, I think r really, uh, I think in any other setting or any other time, any other game, I'd, I don't think they counted. I just think it was just too close. I think by the, you know, the naked eye, I just don't think they count it. So I, I just walked up, like I kind of went to, you know, midway to the court when they were huddled up. I'm like, there's no way you guys can count this, can you? And they just mm. like, and then they just turn like, yeah, we're going to count it. And I turn and I just kind of put my head up and I said, okay, all right, let's go. And and like you said, we were still up and, you know, still feeling pretty good. But it's, you know, watching this a couple of times, you know, like I have, um, you know, it was obviously a, a huge momentum change for it. So, you know, and like I said, Adam, these are the talks that, you know, we need to have. That's why we wanted to get this podcast started, you know, to have this conversation between coach and ref and kind of get your perspective of what happened there too. Yeah, and, and you're exactly right. Like, for, from the naked eye, you, you just – I don't think you can count that. Like, it, it's three-quarter court. You, you're not seeing – from where he's looking there is the official. So, Herman, that doesn't know, the person who's in charge of the last second shot is one guy. It's the guy following the court, the play down the court, from the trail or from behind, and he's the guy who's away from the scorer's table, so on the other side of the court. So, in this case, it was Dale Ferris from PEI. He's watching the guy shoot it, but – he can only hear the sound. He's not looking at the backboard from that angle where the red lights come on, you know, in the buzzer, which you could use as a was it released or not. So if you're in doubt in that moment, you can't count that one. Now, in his mind, it's 64-47 for you guys. Mm -hmm. He might, might be thinking, I don't know, maybe I'll count this, and it's not going to really affect the outcome. But guess what? You lost by one. Right. And, and who knows? And, and I've done some dumb, like I, I had a 24 second or an eight second uh, backboard violation against you guys, the field house this year that I, pro you know, I probably blew that one. That's going to happen to referees. But point being, when you're in the championships, if there's doubt to the naked eye, I don't see how you can count it. And I said as much on the broadcast. I just I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it was it was tough. And I think we kind of had somebody there. Right. And um you know, I'll get more into it as we get to the end, you know, because I think a lot of people would say I've had a lot of good luck as a coach, but this was just kind of one of those games where, you know, I just, I, I felt like we didn't get any luck. As good as some of the things were for us throughout the course of the game, obviously, and how we played, um, you know, obviously some things didn't go our way down the stretch. Yeah, and, and really, we'll get to more of the replay thing down down the end, but but people are beating the drum on this because there's that play. And then, you know, there's the play at the end. We're going to talk, you know, I'm sure. A little oh, bit yeah, we'll definitely sure. get to that uh, but, master's but, bucket. Yeah, but in the FIBA rule book, you know, there's provisions for video replay. Like, we're there. Neil, you're the replay guy. You could have had that cranked up in, you know, Easily. two minutes. Yeah. Easily. Right? I, think so the, I think that's the cool thing for me, you know, and where I work too is that my boss, John Ryan, who's the head of – basketball for the league as well he was down at the score ta <laughs> scores table after after the game talking about both of these plays and like that's how yeah. passionate he is and how much he wants to see us succeed right so that's why it's so cool you know being able to work for a guy like that too and listen i and, and i'm sure if he's watching the uh, uh you know a uh, saint of x saint mary's game and that happens to somebody as a guy who loves basketball and it could be his team next would be equally as invested in getting that done, right? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's it's one of those things, man. But but yeah, let's 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 mosey on because we got we yeah, got lots more. to do here. So <laughs> it's kind of a ho hum moment, you know. That third, um, you guys have to deal with that three point, but it's a huge bucket for UMB. Every player leaves the bench; they're carrying pitcher off the court to finish the third. You know, emotions are high for UMB, and they really get it flying here in the fourth. They go on a 9-0 run. But before that, there's a big momentum twist because Oz gets a huge offensive rebound for the Capers, and then he gets absolutely mugged on the way to the rack. No call. Officials certainly didn't let anybody know that the whistles were going away by this point. You know, it, it, two plays almost back-to-back, -back, Matt, that didn't go your way, speaking of bad luck. You know, how does that affect your game plan further into the fourth? Yeah, I thought that one really hurt us. I mean, it's one of those things where, as a coach, what I tell 
my players is that I'm always going to have your guys back. So if, if there's something where I'm going to defend you, like there's, there's calls that happen there where guys mess up, like you didn't do something right or you did something wrong, but I always try to have their back as far as, you know, when there's large collisions that happen like that, I, I want to whistle. And, and so I, the ref said in that moment, you know, there was verticality there. There was no foul, but I'm just like, with the, with the speed of the collision that happened, I just felt like there had to be a call of some kind, whether, you know, you call it on us or whether you call it on them, there had to be a call in my opinion. And, um, but yeah, that's kind of, you know, to let it go in that scenario with, you know, our best player laying on the floor, just kind of with his hands up being like, what coach, what's happening. You know, that's a moment where I have to defend my player for sure. No doubt about it. And by this point, you know, I think this is a lot where the way I thought the game was going to go and a lot of people too, where we had the runs in the third quarter, back and forth, blow for blow. Uh, You know, you guys hit some adversity there again with, with Ozzy getting undercut there. Spurl gets rolling a little bit. He hits a three right after that gets another layup to cut it to five. And then I thought you pushed the button on a great timeout. We talked about your no calls and timeouts earlier that worked out. This is another good one because you guys were doing a lot of stuff right. You're playing some great D. The UMB was hitting some tough shots. And sometimes it's not about a timeout to say what you're doing wrong. You're reminding your guys, I would think at that point, not trying to speak for you, that they're doing a lot of stuff right and to just stay the course. And, and, and you know, you still got the lead and you're still right there. Yeah, I think that was basically what that was for. I mean, obviously, big momentum swing. You know, we we did have a big lead in the first half. But like I said, I think we kind of expected it to be a close game. So I think it was just one of those timeouts where I said, hey, we knew this was going to be a close game. We knew that they were going to be playing tough. We're the underdog here. We're in a great position uh, heading down the stretch. So let's just do what we do do what we've been doing the whole game and, uh, and keep it going. And, you know, as we move down the stretch there and get into the final plays, I think as a coach, you know, heading into it, I think that's where I was a little bit, you know, it was the most devastating for me because I just felt we did everything right down the stretch, you know? So um, Neil, I don't know if you want to cue up kind of what happened in the last couple minutes there and then we can get into it. Yeah, sure. So Spurrell, Demboya, and Masters kind of put on a show. They start making it to the rim, and they uh, get within one. 68-67 I've got at the 324. Malak fouls Hankins, and he hits both. Um, But then, you know, 75-71, Masters hits a huge three. Demboya, Masters, he'll launch one. Masters hits it for three. How about that release? Snapped the wrist, stared it down. He knew that was good. CJ Bennett, steal and run for two. Four on the shot clock. Turnover. Bennett back the other way. Delays and has the bucket. But the ball comes loose. CBU forces this crazy loose ball on a possession as well. Ugala just puts the body on the line, comes up with the big dive on the free ball. Masters. Masters gives it away. Ball is loose. Oh, he dove on top of him. And it's going to be Cape Breton ball on the jump ball. That's at, what's that, 19 9 left in the game. So. What's going through your head when you see that free ball on the ground? Do you know your guys are going to be the dogs that are come up with this ball? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's what you hope so as a coach, you know, and that you've kind of put your team through enough of those moments in practice and you, you trust them enough. And Isaiah is just one of those guys for us where, you know, kind of like Paul, we just keep wanting him to be aggressive and play with more of an edge. But, you know, in that moment, I was pretty confident that he would, you know, he would come up with it. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Neil, I'll I'll let you keep going in a second, but another wonderful timeout where you're saying, NBA style, we got the best score in the game in in your mind, Ozzy Omar. We're clearing this thing out, man, and and you do your thing. Clock here is 19. Oh no, it's the jump ball situation, so it stays at 19. 14 seconds left. Omar drains a three. And it's a one-point lead for CBU. Osman Omar, he's been doing it all night long. Cajones, Osman Omar, 
up top, raises up. He's been great, straight line of the rim. Look at him, he didn't even see Malak defending him there. Eyes locked on that orange iron, put the air underneath the basketball. You're the conference scoring champion. You're getting the ball, you're getting that shot, and Omar delivered. And he buries the three over Malak, like just, just a bomb at that so point. So clutch. Yeah, to I go thought, up 76, 75. I mean, how, how massive is that? Yeah, I thought it was great. I thought the execution out of the timeout was perfect. And that's where, again, where it was the hardest thing to talk to the guys after the game because here's a play. I think we put Hankins in for Diawara really late in the timeout as well, just so that we had some extra shooting out there to make sure that everybody out there was a three point threat. And, you know, he went, he, wasn't sitting down in the timeout to like see exactly what I had drawn up. So, but he went out there and executed perfectly what we were supposed to do. And we got Ozzy the ball where we wanted him to get the ball. And, you know, he drilled that shot. And it like I said, it was the execution was perfect, um, you know, at that point for us too. So timeout after that big three, you know, feels pretty good. UMB draws a play up. But don't count UMB out to shoot one from behind the arc because if they get an open look, they're going to take the best shot available. They get it to Masters. Ten seconds now remaining. Four seconds. Masters on the drive, puts it up, gets the bucket. They going to count it? Yes. Well, Masters admits later in an interview with Allen that the plan wasn't to go to him. It was to go to pitcher. And you guys clogged the lane really well. And Or, uh, sorry, Spurrell. And you guys kept the ball out of his hands. Masters had to make a last-minute dash to the net. A little left-hand scoop. Uh, before we get to that, Watson plays unbelievable defense on this play. So mm -hmm. the second that that ball leaves Masters' hands on the scoop shot, what are you thinking, Coach Skin? You know, Boom. obviously, this is going to be a last-second shot. It's in the air. You've got your best defender on their best player going to the net with the ball, uh, and it plays out poorly for you guys. Yeah, well, I think legitimately, and this is the story that I've been saying to people, is that I had to, like, contain myself from, like, jumping up in the air and being excited about winning that game because after everything that had happened, we executed again perfectly in that possession, got our switch that we wanted. You know, we have our best defender – on the ball, plays perfect defense, and I almost jumped up in the air afterward and was like, "Yes, perfect!" You know, as they, as they took uh, Marcus took that shot over Paul, um, and then just crazily went in. Just like it, it was just like I said, just crazy that it went in. And we all just kind of looked around. We we're looking up at the replay, trying to figure out if it actually went in. But um, the three refs ran off the court, literally didn't, didn't wait for the, sh the hands to shake or anything like that. They sprinted off the court as quick as they could. And so we knew that it counted. Yeah. It was literally 10 out of 10 defense. Like, yeah. you know, th there's a picture, you know, you, you have it on your social media accounts. You're not letting the boys forget. I love it. Ride, ride that momentum for, for, you know, six months till you tip off again. But, but Watson is literally like over top of, of Masters. And he just th he throws it up. Couldn't have been a wilder shot off yeah. the top of the backboard. Yeah, I, like I, I I feel like I'm a bit sadistic that way. Like I feel UMB was like riding that momentum and like using it as collateral for their social media for a, for 24 48 hours. And I went and liked every single thing that they retweeted. <laughs> I retweeted some uh. of it. I made a list of it. I went on Instagram and reposted it. I just did every one because, you know, I got to be honest, <laughs> I don't think it should have counted. So uh, I'm sure they, you know, fans for UMB think opposite, but to me it shouldn't have counted. So that's why, you know, I feel like it, it was a big uh, motivator for us moving forward. Yeah, so that ball did. It left Masters' hand, top of the backboard, little bit of shot clock, and then drops in like, just wild bounces there, Adam. And, you know, what, uh, every camera that we had really did not show it hitting the shot clock. So That's a tough part. Yeah, yeah Intel like, Superfan like, had the visuals of the ball hitting that support beam that holds the clock up, you know. Uh, there just wasn't evidence that it wasn't a good basket.
you can see then it hits the top of the backboard. And it's not the square of the shot clock that it hit, which is what you're typically looking for. There's these weird support arms that also kind of come behind there a little bit, and they're set back. The trouble is, from on the court, these arms are painted jet black. And you're looking into, typically at the uh, AUS tournament, there's nobody really sitting right behind there uh, in terms of those sight lines. So the seats are dark blue, black in nature at the Scotiabank Center. So that all blends in. And the ball does pop up a little bit. It's hard to tell from the front where the officials are if that just comes up and down or if it goes bang, bang and down, right? So they count it. They're in doubt. I guess it's really hard to not count that one, obviously, at that time. And so Neil and I start looking at the replays, all the different angles. And where our cameras are, are obviously on the, that side of the court as well. You couldn't tell definitively that it wasn't a basket. So I go off and I say, you know, Peter, that's a basket. It counts. You know, man, I know you were looking at the scoreboard a little bit live yeah. time. It kind of looked good at that point. It looked good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, someone had the video and it doesn't lie. Now, could we have slowed it down frame by frame if there was – replay at the time right you could have probably done a lot more work with it neil yeah and, and be interesting to get your perspective in the track from that if the referees had the ability to say let's go to the replay system uh, which is in the fever rule book again i mentioned it before we probably could have done a little bit more with that yeah i mean real quick before you get into it neil and obviously i'm biased because but yeah. even when i watch the aus feed and the the bell feed after seeing it and, and watching it in real time, like the only thing that I can tell as a coach is that the momentum of the ball changes. Like you can see the ball going backwards and then coming back forwards, even in that feed. And that's the thing, like, even if you were just spinning a ball on the backboard um, for mm -hmm. it to like change directions like that, you know, I don't need to get into Newton's laws of physics here. Uh, I know referees. You're right. They don't need me to talk <laughs> about uh, those things, but I mean, yeah. you could tell it changed direction and didn't just slide and then slide into the basket. So that's right. The direction it was going, it was going to go behind the net and all of a sudden it just bounced forward and, and bingo, bango to 77, 76 UMB. Yeah. But you know, there's so many different angles to look at that from. And like you said, Adam, you know, even it was the same in the truck. There was a little hesitation, but then once we saw the refs were good to go, boom, they're out of here. Why would we look at it again? This is a good two sure. points. Show yeah, it, it, right. And, 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 you know, that's a little bit us too. Had we watched it five or six times, maybe live, we could have said that. Would that have been good or bad at the time? Because there was no changing it. Who knows, right? Like you're still, you're supporting your partner in, in the AUS at that point. But yeah. it, I think it's worth saying from a referee's perspective and not defending them just because, because there's plenty of times, you know, we're all wrong. We go back in the locker room and you feel like shit. Plain and simple, you feel terrible. When, when that stuff goes wrong. But again, the guy away from the table on the other side of the court from where the shot took place was responsible for making that decision. The guy closest to it, he's watching the contact with right. Watson and Masters. And you're following that all the way to the floor to make sure that it's a legal shot, everything is good. So the guy under the hoop maybe would have had the best look because if he looks up there right. and through, it's tough. Now, you're trained to not watch the play to the ball typically because there's rebounding action. That's not what the guy to the hoop is by the book supposed to do. Now, right, should you throw the mechanics out in the last 10 seconds? Probably so. Right. right. But there's a lot of things, a lot of habitual things that would have maybe caused the referees to not see that one. Uh, the camera angles were tough. The color was tough, like I said. But, boy, wouldn't you just love to have that rule in for next year? Because human error is one thing. I think it's important at that point to have it different. It's, it's just so – it's so tough, and, you know, to have my boss, John Ryan, right down on the floor, you know, saying what's going on, like no, knowing that it shouldn't have counted as, like, the head of, uh, you know, AUS basketball for the men's side. It was pretty great to see that and the passion that he has and things like that, which – you know, why, why it's great to be a part of things at CBU for sure. But it was just, like I said, uh, I feel people would probably say I've had a lot of good luck coaching, especially there, but I thought we had four things in that game that were just like crazy luck uh, in the first half. Chris Hankins contested a three and touched uh, a three point shot as they released it uh, for UMB it. and it still went in. Then we blocked a layup off the backboard, fully blocked it, and it went in. 
<laughs> and then we had the three quarter court shot and then the final shot at the end of the game, right? So for four things like that to happen to us in the course of a basketball game, there's just some something was out to get us, I guess, that night. It was just it was a yeah. crazy, crazy game. It's one of those things, man, that I think both teams can take a lot of positives from it. You guys executed, you fought, and you grinded the whole way. You UNB put themselves in a position to have some good luck. They didn't roll over and die after the first quarter. You know, we talked a lot about Demboy and Spurl. Pitcher was great. Masters. They their their best players were their best players that night for sure. No doubt about that. And you know, you guys executed mm-hmm. on the final timeout, Matt. Omar does his thing. Your team was locked in the huddle. Both of you guys, even though you lost, I think both teams really, you know, voted well for themselves, both as coaching staffs and as players. It, it's a tough one for you. There's lessons to be learned, you know, all around as a league, as officials, as players. For but, sure. uh, you know, it, it's it's one of those things, it, it's gut-wrenching and it's it hurts to lose. But but you guys, like you said in the locker room, did everything right. And you and me said, we gave ourselves a chance to be luckier to catch the breaks or however you want to term it. So, you know, it's yeah, not, it's I, not I, I don't want to, I don't want to like take anything away from UNB either. That's the thing with all this, you know, as crushing yeah. as it was. And as you know, in my opinion, a couple of things shouldn't have counted, but they fought, man. Like they, they just fought. And like you said, they put themselves in, in such a good position and, you know, to have, you know, Brent and, and daily, you know, coach those guys up like they did, you know, to put them in that position, like, all credit to them. I, I don't want to take anything away from them. That's the first thing. Like I, I tip my hat off, you know, to, to teams that are good and, and things that happened. And, but it, it still doesn't mean that it does. It didn't kill me. Like it just was, brutal. Oh, of course it was just yeah. brutal. And I think, you know, besides all that and, and having a little bit of peace of mind, as far as, you know, we did everything right. I felt like down the stretch and that's, you know, rewarding as a coach to know that the team did everything right. The other really positive thing for me was that I stayed and watched um, semi semifinal Saturday as well. And I encountered so many people who kind of came up to me and were like, oh, we feel for you. You know, we, it was a crazy game, all this great stuff. And for me to just like have to sit there and talk about it and like kind of put myself through that was a little bit therapeutic for me to be able to have to sit there and talk about it versus just like, going home and sitting on my couch and, you know, sitting with my dogs and just being like, why me? Right. Like it was yeah. Yeah. dogs licking the tears off. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. You know, (laughs) that would have been no good for anybody. So it was, it was good for me that way for sure. And and listen, I like, this is one of those AUS classics. It's, it it sucks to be on the other side of it, but both of your fan bases are are just wonderful, right? Like the orange army, they come out strong, hard. So well. UNB, the, the, the only U.S. team over there in the province of New Brunswick, they, they traveled. Their student section was fantastic. They got some warriors, like you said, and Coach Baker and, and Coach Daly to follow with those kids, too. It, it, was, a, it was an AUS classic. Now, yeah, for sure. Now, there was a number 35 Capers jersey in the front row. Old school one where there's white in the front, orange yeah. in the back. Oh, yeah. I was trying to see the whole game who he was. Who like who is this guy? He had access to the vault of jerseys. Yeah, it was a uh, guy who used to come to camps and he played at Sydney Academy. Uh, okay, cool. Pat, I think Pat Ryan it was. So he was rocking the old uh, <laughs> Dave Phillips slash Will Fagan jersey. It was amazing. Oh, that that was my that was my vintage. That, yeah, oh yeah, you you donned those bad boys. Oh, for I, sure. That was uh, that was fun to see. But it just speaks to like this is a legendary league, man. And in, in, in the first podcast, you mentioned the older gyms and the small gyms, but but the history here is, is second to none. I mean, you know, it's fun to cover, it's fun to be a part of, but but yeah, <laughs> hopefully it turns out a little better for you guys. Yeah, I just it was, <laughs> it was just, I I don't know if I if I said this already, but I feel like I've just caught some bad luck here before, you know, mm-hmm. with Cashrell hitting a bank three, you know, against us a, a few years ago in this shot. Like, I don't know. I don't know what else I'm going to have to do. You You're know, doing for some good stuff. <laughs> my man. That's what that yeah. Means. Yeah. Hopefully, right. hopefully, you know, when we're, when we're holding the banner here in a couple more years, when, you know, we'll remember this moment and know that it, uh, it drove us to you know, be the champions that we're going to be again. That's for sure. 
Yeah, without question. Without and I question. want to mention, you know, I brought it up last week about young teams getting the opportunity to play on the Scotiabank floor. Like, really, your guys who are going to be back here next year have really run the gamut. They know what it's like to be up 20, have it slip away, and then to lose it in a crushing last second shot. You know, I think that means so much that they had to deal with so much more drama than, you know, just an average basketball game. Yeah. Really excited to see the Orange back hopefully next year and beyond. What do you think, Matt? Clearly, you know, you're going to be able to ride a lot of these guys back to this situation and it's going to hurt just the same as last year. Yeah, I, I think that was the big message in our exit meetings this year was like, if it's possible to keep momentum for six months or a year, let's keep the momentum going as much as we can. Because, I mean, I think it was less than a week after the we finished, the guys were in scrimmaging and getting shots up and doing their thing. They didn't take any time off, essentially. And I don't really normally like that. I want them to take time off and focus on their studies. But I didn't really want to get in the way of what they were trying to do. And they kind of have this focus. And hopefully that keeps, you know, keeps going moving forward. And we have guys who are just a little bit older now. And I think we're adding a really good recruiting class moving forward. And we're just really excited about what's going to happen at CBU. Yeah, and credit a lot of guys. We've talked a lot about the stars in this game. I, I thought, you know, for, for you guys, Jason Callahan was massive in a few stretches. It, let's face it, his first quarter was god awful. Yeah. And somehow he flushed it. And you know, worked his magic, known as a three-point shooter, but he was getting looks inside the rim. He was a key part of two different runs that kind of sparked you guys, I thought, in the second and third quarter. Uh, it's worth noting how, how awesome he was. And a couple of guys from UMB, too. I thought Matur Malak, you know, his shooting numbers uh, weren't awesome in this game. He was two of eight, but he's long. He, he, he's a good defender there. However, Leotard was only two of six as well. Uh, but, but another guy that just brings length and, and does some of the small things stays in his lane similar to Jason, you know what I mean? Knows when to push, knows when to defer uh, for CBU. I, you know, really like like it was full team efforts for, for both guys and, and loving to see a majority of these dudes back next year. Like you said, Neil, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, the, the last thing I'll say was I was just really impressed with UNB because the one guy who hurt us every game we played them during the regular season was Sterling Simpson. And he got hurt and didn't even play in this game. So – we were, we were feeling pretty good about that in a lot of ways because he's just kind of this mucker and does all the little things and a hustle player and just like end of the shot clock will get a rebound or hit a shot. He's just kind of one of those guys. And, you know, he's going to be a, a presence for them moving forward, even though he wasn't able to play that weekend. Right on, guys. Well, I think that's it for this week's episode. Uh, what do you guys uh, – anything to add before we move on? Yeah, I, I think well, it – Hey, go sorry, ahead. No, you go, Adam, first. No, I was just going to say, I, it sets up a wonderful rest of the weekend. I mean, the men's tournament this year was great. The semis were, were, were fire for the most part. And, and, you know, the women's side, you know, let's not forget, we're doing both sides here moving forward. It was uh, the AUS voted for themselves really well. Again, it sucked for you guys, buddy, uh, you know, for, for that loss. But, but I think to was, have that uh, viral clip going out there for the AUS only does good things. So, oh, yeah. Right, for better or worse, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think as a conference, it, it built us up a little more, as did the tournament. But, uh, yeah, no, I'll let you go with the final thoughts. No, I was just going to say, shout out. I said I was going to wear a different shirt all the time. So this is my Team Canada shirt from – shout out to Mombi Diawara, who gave this shirt to me from University of Calgary when he played for – Team Canada for the FISU games and the Commonwealth games. He hooked me up with this shirt. And then my hat tonight, Gravitech Systems. That's my uncle's company based in Seattle. So just want to give all those people a shout out. Nice. Yeah, man. And watch, I watched game six again of the Raptors last night. Relive the championship vibes again. Uh, man, you, you, you got you to gotta just love basketball in this country from the top all the way down to the AUS. Like, it, it's – like, I know we don't got time in this podcast. I think we should talk about it at some point. They're going on about recruiting rules, differences in money, you know, West, Quebec, Atlanta compared to Ontario. I, I, I think there's a lot of stuff that we can continue our yeah, university game on what we're focusing on. That's a combo for another time. But point being, what a wonderful time to be a basketball fan in this country. It's – it's uh, yeah, it's out of this world. Guys, thanks for uh, letting me – um, be therapeutic here tonight and going through this with me. I appreciate it. And uh, thank God that's over.
Yeah, yeah man. It's <laughs> is there a CBU soccer loss or something we can rewatch? Uh, <laughs> no, we can't. I don't want to do that to anybody. But <laughs> There's thanks, not too guys. many people that would have been willing to do it. Uh, appreciate and, and it. Sit there and talk. But no, I appreciate you 100%. And, uh, yeah, it's all good, man. Moving thanks, on. Guys. in the books, boys. See ya. Four's yeah. up. <laughs> um, lick out, lick out, lick out. Oh, 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 oh